Good morning. morning. My name is Mike Alcoholic. I'm waiting for a host to get up one of these times. I've never heard this. I I would love to see a host get up and say, I picked the speaker up at the airport and this guy, I can't stand him. (laughs) He is an arrogant bum. I really want to thank the committee for inviting me to, uh, to Maryland. I just love it out here. I haven't really seen a whole lot of the area. I do want to tell you I come from Denver and that's two hours behind, so in Denver right now it is 8, 10 in the morning. Uh, I want to tell you for an alcoholic such as myself, I don't do anything before (laughs) 9. So if you see in this talk that I wake up about halfway through it, um, that's what's going on. Uh, The food has been great, Um, people have just really taken care of us here. Uh, It's been really pleasant. When you speak at a few of these, you find out that people don't talk to you until you've spoken. Uh, And when you're the Sunday morning speaker, (laughs) gets a little lonely out there. That's why you'll see some speakers, we look at you, but you know, well, come on over, talk to me. I really enjoyed this conference and I got in late Friday and I haven't heard all the speakers. I'm really looking forward to um, hearing the tapes. However, I did hear Jim talk last night and I love it when people that have been sober longer than myself talk because they, they share what I will get to experience down the road and I am just really grateful to find out that when I'm 27 years sober I can stand outside of my house naked holding a gun. <laughs> inviting all the burglars in my neighborhood to come on in. (laughs) However, I don't have a wife to blame that on since I'm single today, and I could blame it on my golden retriever, however, I guess. I don't know. Uh, Camille, uh, I heard her yesterday, and, and, and I just absolutely love the woman. Her and I got sober at the same club. We uh, knew each other in very early sobriety when we were both about 99% crazy. Uh, Now we're, at least for myself, I'm 50% crazy. Uh, And it was great to hear her talk. Actually, it was funny, because she has has a couple years on me, and she was driving a bus at the time I got sober. (laughs) And every once in a while, I'd go to York Street, 1311 York Street, and as she said yesterday, it's this big mansion, it's a historical building now, and there'd be this city bus parked right in front of the place. And we knew Camille was in the house, you know. (laughs) Actually, Camille and I were quite young when we, uh, young in sobriety, and and we were considered getting sober young at that time. And uh, she was talking about enjoying the fruit basket uh, now, some 20-some years later. And, you know, I don't know, there's something going on here. I, I just don't consider myself an old-timer. However, there have been some suggestions made lately. Uh, I've become more opinionated. There was a young lady gave a great lead at our home group. And uh, she was talking about when she was drinking about how wild she was. And how she was taking men home with her every night. And I went up to her and I said, that was a great lead. I said, I wish I had, you know, where were you when I was drinking? (laughs) She looked dead in my eyes and said, I wasn't born yet, Mike. (laughs) It's called putting you in your place real quick. Well, it's a beautiful Sunday morning. We're here to talk about recovery. See, I believe alcoholics. I believe alcoholics can get sober, but how do we stay sober? That's what we're here to talk about. How do I get God between me and the next drink? You know? I got sober on April Fool's Day in 1975. My sponsor has always said it's the greatest April Fool's joke he's ever seen. (laughs) They took bets that I would not make it. My home group today, and I got to tell you that I hate the name of my home group. I I really do. My home group's called Happy Way. (laughs) We think it's, there are new people that literally think that's a group of people on Prozac. (laughs) 
Have you heard that they're making a new pill with uh, Prozac and Viagra? If it doesn't work, you don't care. <laughs> we all have sex problems. We wouldn't be human if we didn't. <laughs> I come from a family where alcohol is one of the four basic food groups. Um, you know, my dad was a drunk, and I remember sitting there as a kid saying, I never want to be like that guy. I hope and pray I never become like him. He was exactly what the big book talks about. He was the nicest guy you ever wanted to meet sober, and when he had a few drinks in him, he became mean, he became violent. And I remember when I was about 13 years old, I went to a junior high school dance, and this kid said, I stole some liquor out of my dad's liquor cabin, and he said, let's go out back and let's, you know, let's have a taste. Now, I was a real antisocial kid. I couldn't, I couldn't get along with anybody, and I know you've heard in Alcoholics Anonymous, I was a square peg trying to fit into a, to a round hole and, and that type of thing, and that's exactly where I came from. I just never felt like I fit anywhere. But I do remember going in the back of this school, and I remember he took out some kind of bourbon. I really couldn't tell you how much or, or what type it was, and I remember I took a little, you know, kid's drink. And I remember I absolutely hated the taste. And I remember looking at him, and I, I just sort of, you know, swallowed it as fast as I could. Of course, you've heard the John Wayne syndrome here a couple of times, and you know, I, I had the same thing of, give me some more of that. And I took a second drink all of a sudden, and all of a sudden that booze went from here down to here, and a glow came over me. Everything became right in the world. It was the greatest feeling I'd ever had. All my fears left me, all my loneliness left me, everything was perfect. Now, let me tell you, that night, I vomited, passed out. I was told I had my first sexual experience. <laughs> I got home at 5 o'clock in the morning, and I paid the price. And I went to bed, and I said, God, I just can't wait until I can do that again. <laughs> Give me another chance. And, you know, I didn't know this until I was sober for quite a long time. But most of my decisions from that point in time were based on alcohol, you know? Now, I'm here to tell you that when you speak at these things, uh, you know, my sponsor gave me some great advice a long time ago. He says, tell the truth and talk about what you know about, okay? And what I can talk about <clears throat> is identifying with alcoholics. And then how did I recover? You know, experience, strength, and hope. And once I took that first drink, I have come to find out that alcohol took me. I really didn't have any choices in it. And I did not grow up to be an alcoholic. Actually, I wanted to be a jock. I was pretty gifted athletically. And it basically got me through school. And it was interesting because I hung around with the drinkers, but I played football and baseball. When I was about 15 years old, I was put into a boy's home because I kept running away all the time. And when I was put into this boy's home, we kept right on drinking. But in this boy's home, I lifted weights and I got bigger and I came out of this boy's home and my folks had moved to Worthington, Ohio. I was born in Madison, Wisconsin. And we moved to Worthington, Ohio. And I went and I played football there one year. Now I'm going to tell you what a drunk does with any kind of success whatsoever is I played there one year, made All-State my very first year, and got a full boat football scholarship to Ohio State University. I went to Ohio State University and I drank myself out of it in four months. People like Woody Hayes did not like you if you didn't show up to practice. Woody Hayes himself called me in his office and he said, I have not seen a kid with as much talent as you got who's just wasting it. But see, I had already had that mindset where nothing meant nothing. I was indestructible. 
See, my disease of alcoholism tells me I'm either better than you or I'm worse than you. And I can be looking at the same person, thinking both things at the same time. <laughs> now, is that schizophrenia or what? <laughs> Somebody told me one time that schizophrenia is a good way to not have to eat alone. You know, I was a sociopath at a very young age. And I'm not here to impress you with some of the things that I did or anything like that. Actually, I had a much better drunk log when I was newly sober. There was a blind guy at this 1311 York Street, and I was like a week sober, and I'm sitting there and I'm telling him all this, and he's just, he's an old timer. He didn't have anything else to do but sit there and listen to me, I guess. And he sat there and he listened to my whole story and he says, you know, he says, Mike, he says, I don't know how old you are, but you've got to be in your 70s by now. <laughs> I had a wonderful drunk lot. See, I was just like that. I either had to be the best or I had to be the worst. Well, when I, when I dropped out of uh, college, the Army picked me up and I got to spend a year in Vietnam. Now what happened to me in Vietnam was this, is that I learned how to mix alcohol and drugs. As a matter of fact, some of the other guys used to call me the pharmacist. And the reason for that, and I talk a little bit about this, and I am not a drug addict, I'm an alcoholic by the way, and I'm going to say some things about that that may upset a couple people. Uh, but I learned how to mix alcohol and drugs to get the desired effect. See, I wanted to keep that high going all the time. I wanted to keep that buzz going all the time. Because that's the only way I felt whole. That's the only way I knew how to socialize with you, was to drink. I came out of the military, and I could screw that up, too, because they sent us back, and I'm in the Oakland Army Terminal, and they gave us a 48-hour pass. I went into San Francisco. I got drunk. I showed back up 30 days later. Now, they said to me, they said, this is not a very good idea. I'm about to get discharged, folks, in about three months. And they said, we're not going to prosecute you. We're just going to put you in on house arrest. They put me in on house arrest. There were some guys that had some booze in the barracks. I had a couple of drinks of that. I, I left the base, and I came back 45 days later. They ended up court-martialing me and shoving me out on a general under honorable condition. Now, there were four of us that got out together, and we went down into San Francisco. And if any of you are familiar with San Francisco, there's an area down there called the Tenderloin District. Now, the Tenderloin District is not a very nice place. It's quite, it's quite well, they, I think they counted something like 82 topless places in about a 15-block area. And so anyway, we were down there, and we went out on a massive drunk. It lasted about three weeks. Some of us had tattoos we didn't remember. Some of us had wives we didn't remember. And I'm standing there on the street corner. We're broke. We're hungry. We had, we'd been drinking for about three weeks. And all of a sudden, at this one place, and it, it, it was a notorious, it was a notorious place, I see this ambulance pull up and people are running out of this place and I said to this guy who was running out, I said, what's going on in there? And he said, the bartender just got shot in the head. And I looked at him and I looked at my buddies. Now, in this sick mind, that's a job opportunity, okay? <laughs> I went into that place, and the guy was laying down there behind the bar, and I'm going, who's the owner? I said, I can tend bar. He says, great. He says, uh, been doing it long? Oh, yeah, forever. Alcoholics are survivors, I swear. How do we survive out there? It's absolutely amazing, you know? Anyway, he hired me, and I remember he said to me, he says, here's the rules of the place. He says, you can drink with your customers. There's a bottle of... Uh, speed, actually it was dexedrine underneath the bar, he says you can take as much of that as you need and he said don't steal more, from, more than 10% from me and we'll be fine. I looked around and I went, God I'm home. <laughs> this place was owned by the mafia. 
And that comes into play a little bit later in my sobriety. I don't want to go through a huge drunk log here, but alcohol started taking me in places I didn't even want to go. I got arrested out there for various charges. I never went to prison. You know, I was always a drunk trying to make a comeback even though I'd never been there before. Um, I never did go to jail. I, I mean, I, I went to jail a couple of times and I spent two, three days in there and I spent a little time in the brig when I was in the army, but that was about it. Excuse me, I'm coming down with a little bit of a cold right at the present time. <sighs> Alcohol started taking me places that I never wanted to go. You know, I was attracted to the fast life and I was attracted to the really crazy people. And I had worked my way up into becoming a manager for these guys over three of their best topless clubs in the Tenderloin District. Which was really sort of fun because uh, it was just a good time had by all until it started to not be a good time anymore and until I started passing out at night and things like that. And they, they decided that they were going to get rid of me. And I had met the girl of my dreams. She was one of the dancers in one of the clubs. And she drank just like I did, and she partied just like I did. And well, that was a marriage made in heaven right there. And so anyway, we decided to move to Denver, Colorado, because things were getting too hot on us. And actually, I had some warrants out for me at the time. <clears throat> and so we came to Denver, Colorado, because her folks lived there. And I remember meeting her parents. And I remember her dad was with the railroad, and he says, come on down here into my basement, son. And we walked down, and there was these gallon bottles of Jack Daniels lining the wall. And I looked around, and I said, Dad, how are you? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> he became my best friend instantly. And we stayed there six months, and he used to come up to me and say things like, are you going to go get a job here pretty soon? <laughs> things of that sort. Anyway, this woman got pregnant, and I remember when she walked in and she looked at me and she says, I'm pregnant, I got this sadness in my heart, because I said, this kid ain't got a chance. You know, alcoholism is a dirty disease. We die dirty. Drunks in their cups do not die clean. And you know who gets hurt the worst? It's the kids. I've been in on 12-step calls where I have literally taken the kids out of there. It's the kids that get hurt. And my daughter is probably a major part, of, not probably, is a major part of my story. Because it was when my wife at the time got pregnant, I decided that I was going to clean up my act and I was going to become a solid citizen. The big book says many of us had moral and philosophical ideas galore, but we could not live up to them, even though we would have liked to. I wanted to become a better person. But you see, the problem was is that I was drinking, and as soon as I took that first drink into my system, the phenomena of craving set itself up, and I couldn't get enough. And every time I'd swear it off, and for the next year and a half, about two years, I try to swear off alcohol almost on a every other day basis. I couldn't stay away from the first drink. That's the first step. That's powerlessness over alcohol. And I couldn't understand what was happening to me because I really wanted to become a better person. I really wanted to be a stand-up father to this child. I didn't know what it was at the time that was going to be born. And <clears throat> every time I took a drink, I couldn't handle it. Every time I took a drink, I had a drink as much as I possibly could get in my system. And I'd end up in places I never wanted to end up in. You know, one time when I was in San Francisco and we were down and out, when we first had gotten there, this buddy of mine and I, we decided we were going to rob a bar. This is my criminal career, okay? And I remember he had this drunk car. You know what a drunk car is, right? It's got dings and everything all over the place and the paint job is shot. And he had this drunk car and I was going to be the guy that was going to go in and I was going to rob the bartender at 2 o'clock in the morning when the, when the bar closed. And 
John, he was going to sit in the getaway car. Now, we were dead broke, all right? We were, we were suffering. So I go into the bar, except it's about 1.30. And the bartender says, last call. And there were too many people in there, so I decided to have a drink. <laughs> then I decided to have a couple more drinks. About 45 minutes later, John comes walking in. He goes, Mike, I ran out of gas out here. What are you doing? I said, I'm having, I'm having a drink with my friend, the bartender. My life of crime. <clears throat> my daughter was born. I watched her being born at 7 o'clock in the morning. I told my wife, I said, I'll be back in a couple hours. I went across the street to have a drink. I showed up three days later. These are not things I'm proud of. You know, but this is what alcoholism does to people. Because the, the drink has taken me wherever it wants to take me. You know, I hear people come in and they talk about different bottoms. And I have sponsored men that have sobered up in million dollar homes. And I have sponsored, I sponsor more people actually that have hit the streets because that's pretty much where I hit. You know, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what's going on out here when you get sober. What, what matters is what's going on in here. Have you hit a bottom deep down inside? The thing that led me to Alcoholics Anonymous was I, was, I, was, I had finally gotten this halfway decent job. My daughter was a little over a year old. And my wife at the time, she says to me, she says, one morning, she says, are you going to come home drunk again tonight? Now, she says, you're getting paid today, and I want that paycheck. She says, we're 60 days late on the rent. They're about to shut off the utilities. They have already shut off the phone. I want this paycheck when you get off work. I said, honey, don't worry. I'll be in. I'll be home at 6 o'clock tonight. I got paid that day. I went to work, and there was a bar about a block away from this place that had three for ones from 4.30 to 5. I went in there to have a couple of drinks, and you know the story. I come stumbling in about 3 o'clock in the morning without any money on me, drunk. She said something to me. I said something to her. And when you scare a drunk bad enough, they come out angry. I walked in the bathroom. I come walking out of the bathroom. And all of a sudden, right up here, I see the biggest rolling pin I have ever seen in my life. One of them big pine rolling pins that Grammy used to use, and it was directed right at my head, and she hit me in the head, and I went down like a brick. And I'll never forget the words she said. She was hitting me with this rolling pin saying, you dirty alcoholic, you dirty drunk. She said, you have taken me further down than I ever thought anybody possibly could. Nobody had ever called me that before. People stayed away from me. I had no friends by this time. Nobody really cared what happened to me by that time. She picked up my year and a half old daughter and she walked out the door. And I'm laying on the floor in this kitchen and all of a sudden God put these pictures in front of me and they were in living color. And they were pictures of me as a little kid and they were pictures of me as a teenager with hopes, dreams, just like everybody else. And then there were pictures of me where I was, and the next picture that I saw was me on Skid Row. And when I came out of that, I called Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, it was sort of funny because I was an extremely paranoid drunk. I don't know if any of you can identify with this, but I was just petrified all the time because I was a blackout drinker toward the end and I'd wake up with, you know, bloody hands and I'd wake up with dings in my car and things. So I never knew if anybody had anything on me or not. So I remember when I called Alcoholics Anonymous and I called Central Office, I timed my phone call to less than three minutes so that they wouldn't trace it and find me. See, I was a big deal in my own mind, okay? And I remember this lady, she says to me, she says, well, honey, she says, we can send a couple guys out to your house. Now, I talked about a drunk car. Jim talked about a drunk house. I had a drunk house. I was living in a rented house. It was a drunk house. Grass wasn't mowed. 
you know, the no paint job. I mean, it, it, it was a real mess. And I, I, I'm talking to her, and she says, I can send some guys out to your house. And I had never had any exposure to Alcoholics Anonymous, and I thought, hmm, I better not do that, okay? Because I'm sure they're going to show up in a drunk car, and they're going to have AA t-shirts on. <laughs> and I figured they'd be old guys, you know, with trench coats and stuff. And they'd come in and they'd do something. I don't know what. I says, no, I said, but I'll go to a meeting tonight. And she said, she said, well, there's one right over here. And I went, okay, I'll get there. And I remember it was about 11 o'clock in the morning and the meeting didn't start until 7 o'clock. And I was, I was hurting. I was hurting bad. And I started shaking really bad. And I remember thinking, I'm going to go to this meeting. I'm not going to have a drink between now and the time I go to this meeting. And by the time I got to this meeting, I was really hurting. I was shaking so bad, and I had had these, I had gotten stitched up, and I had 16 stitches in my head. I had two black eyes. I still had the same clothes on that I had, you know, uh, been down on the floor with and bleeding and everything else. I mean, I was a real mess, and I go walking into this meeting, and this meeting had couches. And these people saw me come in. Now, I got to tell you that when I came into the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, I weighed 310 pounds, too. I was so full of bloat, it was ridiculous. And these people saw me come in, and they all got up off this couch and said, here, sit down here. And they all moved to the other side of the room. <laughs> but this little lady, I don't know where she came from. I know her today. But I didn't know where she came from. She walked up to me and she saw me and I'm, I was shaking like this. And she says, can I get you a cup of coffee or something? And I went, you know, yeah. And she brought me this cup of coffee and it had a straw in it. And she set it on the table and she says, honey, that's okay. You don't have to pick the cup up. Just drink out of the straw. And I looked at her and I said to myself, she knows. She knows what I'm going through. See, I couldn't pick that cup of coffee up. I'd have never gotten it to my mouth. You remember trying to take the shots in the morning and stuff? I heard guys say they used to have to tie strings around their necks to bring it up to their mouth. I couldn't bring it up. And I drank that coffee out of the straw, and she talked to me afterward. However, I must tell you that the first meeting I ever went to was on the third step. And they're talking about God. Now, I want to tell you right now, and this is funny, I'm a Sunday morning speaker. I have 14 Lutheran ministers in my family. In spite of that fact, I believe in God today. <laughs> I left there. I couldn't take it anymore, and I went to this bar, and I got drunk, and I'm just going to tell you real quickly that the IRS screwed up, and they sent me some money. I think the IRS can screw anything up. Now that I have my own business, I really know they can. They sent me a little bit of money. It wasn't a whole lot of money, but anyway, I tried to do leaving Las Vegas. I decided since I can't get sober, I'm going to drink myself to death. That's what I'm going to do. Now, I didn't find Elizabeth Shue out there for those of you that have seen the movie. But I bought all this alcohol and I sat there and I sat in this house and by that time the utilities were shut off and they were just letting me stay there because these people were gonna come in and redo the whole house anyway so they just let me stay there for a while. And I tried to drink myself to death and that didn't work. And I had a pistol. And I took this pistol out and I said, I can't drink myself to death, I might as well blow my brains out. Now I had been drinking for about two and a half weeks solid. I hadn't been eaten. I took this gun out. I put it in my mouth. I pulled the trigger. Nothing happened. I threw it up against the wall because I couldn't even do that right, and the gun went off. <laughs> I called this person that, who had given me a phone number to go back to Alcoholics Anonymous because I could see no way out. And they took me down to this place called 1311 York Street. I had surrendered that night. I'm going to tell you what I think surrender is. Surrender is when I am willing to give up my way and do it your way. And until I am willing to give up my way 100% and do it your way, 
This thing will not work for me. I have come to find that out. I remember in my first year or two of sobriety, we used to sit there and talk about rewriting the big book. We, in Denver, we call that the two-year syndrome. We think all people should be 12 step by people with two years of sobriety because they know everything. It's wonderful. It's great. And I think you have to go through it. I know I did. You know? But the longer I have been sober, I have come to realize that the, that the spiritual virtue of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous is that I do it exactly the way it is laid out in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and not take liberty with it. Because that's the only way that I will ever surrender to this program is to do it by the book. They took me down to this place called 1311 York Street and we walked up these steps and I was in really bad shape and I was shaking and there was a couple of guys in there and they sat down and they started talking to me and I couldn't tell you what they said. I have no idea what they said. I don't remember what I did. They were feeding me orange juice and honey and they were feeding me candy bars. And at that time there were not many drunk places where you could go and get 30 days of treatment. You know, so they had us sobering up there. And, and at 1311 York Street at that time, they had these tongue depressors on the walls for people who would go into convulsions. And I remember staying there about 15, 16 hours, and I was getting real sick, and people would come up to me and they'd go, you want to go to a hospital? And I'd go, no, I can't afford a hospital. And these guys took me home. And I literally went into DTs. And I don't think you go into DTs just from drinking. You go into DTs from not eating, hurting yourself. And I went into DTs for quite a few hours. And, and these guys took care of me and they brought me back. And basically my first year of sobriety was sitting at this 1311 York Street Club and, and uh, going to meetings every day and those types of things. But you see, I was really lucky because I got in with some people. I got in with some people that worked the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. I got in with a sponsor who believed that the only way to get well from this disease was by working the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I remember he laid out the big book for me when I was about a month sober. And he went through each of the 12 steps and he said to me, this is how we get well. Are you willing to do this? And at that time, I was willing to do it. You know, I didn't hear much about inner child at that time. I didn't hear much about all that other stuff. By the way, really, I love Camille's statement. You know, the inner adult's the thing I have a problem with. <laughs> and if anybody sees my inner child around here, would you please shoot it? <laughs> you know, it, it just basically got me into a whole lot of trouble. This is a program that works for drunks. They got me clear on my first step. I called myself an alcoholic addict when I first came in, and my sponsor says, it's not true. You're either an alcoholic or you're a drug addict. Which one are you? He made me take a look at it, and what I found out was is that I used drugs to enhance alcohol. Alcohol was the thing that I wanted constantly all the time. We found out who I was and where I was going, and then he took me into the steps. And we worked the steps together. My home group at Happy Way, we do step workshops. And we'll have 30, 40 people. We'll sit down and we go through the book. And what happened when I was about three months sober is the International Convention came to Denver, Colorado in 1975. Now, I am sitting there. I'm three months sober. And I am not one of the happy members of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I am not one of those that sat around and said, oh, God, I'm home. I actually sat around and went, damn, why did this have to happen to me? And all of a sudden, 20,000 happy alcoholics <laughs> descend upon Denver, Colorado. And they're coming up and they're shaking your hand and they're doing this and doing that. And there was another guy there named Dick D who had just come out of Canyon City, the prison, and he and I just sort of sat ourselves in a corner and we growled at people as they came by. 
And we sat around there, and this night they, they took us down to the convention center. And they took us down to the Saturday night speaker meeting. And I remember we were walking down, there was about six of us, and I remember that there was a drunk standing on the corner, sort of sitting standing. And he goes, where are you guys going? Can you give me a buck? We said, well, we're going right over there. There's an Alcoholics Anonymous convention. And he just sort of looked at us, and we took him in there with us. He is still sober today. That's a miracle. But what happened at this convention is what follows is that there was a group in Canada called the Golden Slippers. And this guy was talking. And he talked about his group, that these people in his group could only stay sober for six months at a time, two months at a time, a year at a time, and they'd go get drunk. So what they decided to do was to sit down with the big book and start at the forward to the first edition and read it word for word and do exactly what it says in the big book. If it says, get down on your knees and say the third step prayer, that's what they did. If they said, write an inventory, that's what they did. If it said you go and you make amends a certain way, that's what they did. And he said the most fascinating thing happened. We're all still sober. So there was a group of guys in Denver. Camille mentioned all of them, I think, yesterday morning. We decided to do the same thing. And we formed this group workshop, and we started going through the book. Now, I have to tell you the truth. I did not stick with that group because I didn't think I had the time. My sponsor pulled me out, and I ended up doing my fifth step with him and going through the steps faster than, than that group did. But there were 14 of us that originally started in that group. Today, all of us are still sober or have died sober. Not one person is drank. See, I, I am very concerned about the welfare of Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to keep this program as pure as it was and the message as pure as it was the day I walked in here. This year and a half old daughter that I was telling you about that left when, when, uh, when I got sober, all of a sudden when I was about 10 years sober, I get a call. And... The call is from Denver General Hospital, which is city hospital. He said, we have your daughter down here. Now, I had been seeing my daughter when I could, and I remember when I got sober and I was in the amends process, that I made a promise that I would try to do what I say I was going to do. See, I had lived such a slimeball life that I'd tell you one thing and go do something else. And I decided, and I found out from my sponsor, that honesty is do what you say you're going to do. And I made a promise to my daughter that I would be there for her. And if God willing, I would do everything I could possibly do because I had caused so much damage. And I get this phone call, and this phone call comes in and says, we have your daughter down here. And I says, what happened? And she says, she's down here on an overdose. And I didn't know what was going on. I knew something was strange, and by this time her mom had developed the same disease. I think she'd always had it, but it really came on full-blown. And I didn't know what was going on, and I, I, I went down to Denver General Hospital, and, and there was my kid. My daughter was laying on a gurney. She had handcuffs onto the gurney. She'd been beat up. And I remember, I remember looking down at her, and I remember saying to God, I said, God, how could you let this happen? Thirty days later, I get custody. Now, ten years of sobriety, I'm this single swinging bachelor out here, right? All of a sudden, I got jobs, I got responsibilities, and now I've got this 12-year-old brain-damaged teenager about to move in with me. Oh, it was fun. Over the next six years, I had her in treatment centers two and a half of those years. 
she'd run away. And there's many of you out there that know exactly what I'm talking about. That feeling as a parent when all you want is the very best for your kid and everything's going along just fine and you come walking home that night expecting to spend the night with your kid and they're gone again and you know it. And I'm praying all through this time, God, what is going on? What is going on? What is going on? When she was 19 years old, she ran away from me when she was 17 and a half for the last time. I didn't see her until she was almost 19 years old. I get a phone call. She says, Dad, I'd like to see you. I says, what's going on? She says, I'm going to prison. I said, what'd you do? She says, I sold 10 and a half pounds of heroin to a DEA undercover agent. I said, oh my God. She says, would you please come and see me? I went down, I saw her, I went to her sentence hearing, and I'll never forget it because her and I had talked the day before and she was on, she was on the same road I had been on. She was on exactly the same road, she had the exact same disease that I have, and, and, and something had to stop her. And the judge, for some reason, called me into his chambers before sentencing. And he says, I heard from her probation report that you're a sober member of Alcoholics Anonymous. He says, what do I do with this kid? I says, I don't know what to tell you. I'm not one that's going to tell you to not sentence her. He says, I got to sentence her. She goes to this federal woman's correctional facility. Three years in, three years probation. And she calls me. Six months into this, and we had been writing letters. We were starting to establish contact again. And she calls me six months into this sentence, and she's crying on the phone, and she says, Dad, I really have to talk to you. I said, and something in me, something in me said, something's about to happen. I says, I'm going to come down there, and I'll go down to Phoenix, Arizona. And I'll never forget it because when they let me in to see her and they had a big room and you could all sit and talk. It wasn't, you know, like it's portrayed in the movie sometimes. And I remember she, she jumped in my arms and she held me and she said, Dad, I can't live like this anymore. And I said, is there an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting in this place? And she says, yes, there is. I says, why don't you go? And she says, I will. And she gave me the greatest compliment. She actually gave God the greatest compliment. Because actually, I had been trying to talk to her about AA from the time she was this high. And see, none of that ever mattered. What she said to me was this later. She said, some things had happened in prison. And she said, I looked at my life. And she says, I looked at my mom. And I saw the way my mom was gone. And I looked at my dad. And I saw the way my dad was gone. And she says, I want what my dad had. This is a direct result of God. December, I'm going to celebrate a third year of sobriety with her. You see, God showed me something very important, and I'm, I guess I want to talk just a second before I, before I get into a couple other things about those of us that have been sober for a while going through bad times. You know... <clears throat> We can't delude the newcomer into telling this newcomer that it's going to be peachy and rosy after you get sober. After you get sober, you're going to face everything that, that life has to offer. Sickness, success, happiness, sadness, divorces, bankruptcy. I just had something happen to me in the last couple weeks that it was a minor pebble. I know I'm supposed to watch my language, but I absolutely love my sponsor because he always used to say, drunks pole vault over mouse turds. <laughs> I suffer from lack of perception. <clears throat> We're going to go through bad times in sobriety. But those people that work steps and get a God in their life have something to, to lean back on. You see, the big book talks about two different kinds of people. It talks about a person over here <clears throat> that is having all kinds of trouble. They can't control their emotional nature. They're prey to misery and depression. They can't make a living. They, 
They're, they feel useless. And then it talks about a, another person over here, and this person has peace, power, happiness, and a sense of direction. And what's the difference between this person and this person? It says in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that they have peace, power, happiness, and a sense of direction as soon as they take a few simple steps. You see, the one thing that speakers can do for you here is give you hope. If you came to this convention, and I am a firm believer in this, if you came to this convention and you were down and depressed and today you feel better, that's relief, not growth. The growth occurs when you work the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. The growth occurs when you're sitting one-on-one -on -one with your sponsor. The growth occurs when you're taking somebody else through the steps. I have never seen anybody get in trouble for working the steps too quickly. I have seen a lot of people get in trouble waiting. I have heard things in Alcoholics Anonymous such as, I need my head to clear up first. <laughs> I'm 23 years sober, my head still hasn't cleared up. Jim's head obviously hasn't cleared up. <laughs> I know Camille, I know her head hasn't all cleared up. You know, the old timers, and I have gotten to meet some guys with, with 50, 51, 52 years of sobriety. Actually, when I was a year sober, I met a guy who was sponsored. This was sort of a cute story. I was sitting at 1311 York Street with this guy talking about the merits of suicide. I was... <laughs> How much, how long have I been going? I got a few minutes. And I was about a year sober and things were not getting better quickly, okay? And this guy walks in about 11 o'clock at night and if you've ever been at this club, it's an inner city club, things aren't too bright around there at 11 o'clock at night. And this guy walks in, he's got a suit and tie on and he's beaming. I mean, this guy literally beamed. And <clears throat> he walks up and he sits right down next to me and he goes, you're hurting, aren't you? I looked at him really funny and he starts talking and talking away about this program and about the steps and he put this program together better than anybody I'd ever heard and I'm looking at this guy and he says let's go eat breakfast and we go out and we go eat breakfast and he says it's going to get better this thing will work he says if you just continue to do this stuff and he said the accrued effort of doing the right thing will pay off for you eventually and I'm going who is this guy? And finally, we're eating breakfast. And I, you know, the, the light maybe comes on a little bit. And I said to him, I said, when did you get sober? He says, I got sober in 1938. I said, did you know Bob and Bill? He says, well, Dr. Bob was my sponsor. I went, whoa. <laughs> I said, how did you meet him? He said, well, I came off about a month drunk and my wife had heard about this and took me to his office. And he said, it, it, it basically scared me into sobriety. He says, because I walked up these stairs, saw Dr. Bob Smith's office and it says, Dr. Bob Smith, proctologist. <laughs> he said, oh my God, a new treatment for alcoholism. <laughs> his name was Paul Keebu. You got the tape? Paul and I became friends. Paul passed away a few years ago. What a wonderful man. I've gotten to meet some people who knew Bob and Lois and, and, and uh, I mean Bob, Bill and Lois and Bob, you know, and it, it, it's beautiful the way these people uh, share it and, and you know, and, and this, this message uh, has been there for myself and now it has been there for my daughter, okay? And I hope it's there for her kids, even though I'm not ready to be called grandpa yet. I got to tell you right now, and I told her that recently. I've been through the steps numerous times. I go through the steps once a year. The reason I go through the steps, up, and it's about once a year. The reason I go through the steps once a year is because I am the worst judge of how I'm doing. My brain doesn't work right. See, a really crazy ideal come in, idea will come into this brain, okay? And it will make perfect sense to me. It, this idea, I can rationalize it, it'll be wonderful, okay? But once I bounce it off you, 
it doesn't make too much sense to you. <laughs> and when I'm talking to you and I see your mouth sort of twist <laughs> and your eyebrow go up, I'm getting the feeling. I remember I was two years sober and met this girl. I had this long alcoholic relationship. I think we knew each other three days. Somebody proposed to somebody from the um, podium last night during the dance. I wondered if they'd met Thursday night or something. <laughs> oh, that, that's bad. I'm sorry. I'm telling you right now. My sponsor says I'm half horses, <clears throat> Heine, half child of God, and I never know which side's coming up next. But see, I get these crazy ideas and I can rationalize them. And I have got to go through the steps to keep my life clean and clear. I work out a lot. The working out I did four years ago does not keep me in shape today. It's the same thing with these spiritual principles as far as I'm concerned. And I am not good enough to do a perfect 10th and 11th and 12th step, even though I think those incorporate all the other steps. I want to tell you quickly here my first real experience with God. Because I think it's important. I think we find God in the risk. I don't find God playing it safe. You know, I recently realized that I make decisions from two places. I make decisions based on fear or in trust in God. And I'm trying to make my decisions in life today based on trust in God more than in fear. I went through the steps with my sponsor the very first time, and, and I had the experience that so many of you have had. But you see, I didn't have a God personal to me. I was taught from these Lutheran ministers that if I thought it, I had done it. Well, by the time I'm 13, I'm going to hell. Not that I had done much, but I thought about it all. And back to being the best or the worst, since I couldn't be the best, I was going to be the worst. And I went out there, and I did some pretty horrific things. There were some people I hurt physically. I was very violent. I was the kind of guy that you saw sitting in the bar, and everybody was joking, and everybody had the smile on their face, and then somebody would look at me wrong, and I'd be all over you. And there are people I wish I could find today. I have a daughter I've never seen from those days. I have tried every way possible. Can't find her. I went through the steps with this guy and I remember we were sitting in the fifth step and I remember we got to the end of the fifth step and he said, Mike, is there anything you haven't told me yet? <laughs> and I looked at him and I went, yep. <laughs> and he said, are you going to tell me? I said, nope. He said, that's fine. You don't have to tell me. He said, it ain't going to hurt me. It's going to kill you. Oh. Told him. He said, go on. I did that too. Oh, yeah? How old were you? I was younger than that. See, what happens is you bring the dinosaurs out of the closet and you put them in the light. They don't have the power anymore. And I think the longer you're sober, the more you've got to be aware of that. Because so many of us, when we get sober, we think we have to live up to something. We don't want to share our junk. You know? I have done some crazy stuff sober. I have had to work on anger sober. I have been divorced sober. I have a thing about me that picks the absolute worst women in the world for me. I have, I have appointed two older gals in my group to interview. <laughs> Any woman that I'm going to marry. And, th and they're going to spend some time with her. I went through the steps and I remember I was out and I was making the amends and I did not want to make amends. To this day, I don't like to make amends, even though it has transformed my life. But back to what I was saying about God, 
you find God when you're risking, when you're going for your dream, when you're doing the things that you need to do. You know, this is not about being comfortable. I'm sorry, but if you are writing inventory and making amends and you're comfortable, something is wrong. I had three amends to make in San Francisco. Well, I had more than three, but I had three major amends. And let me tell you what they were. I had to turn myself back into the San Francisco Police Department because I had skipped out on some warrants. Now, I wasn't going to walk in there. My sponsor's an attorney. He checked some things out. He, you know, he, we did it right, and I don't tell anybody to go walking in. <laughs> the second one was when I was tending bar for the mob, I had stolen a lot of money from them. And the third was to find this woman and this daughter that I had never seen. Well, I obviously did not find the daughter. And I remember my sponsor said to me, he said, you have to make these amends in order to stay sober. And he said, you will never know that God is protecting you until you get out there and you risk your hiney on it. I took a bus back to San Francisco. I didn't have the money. I was driving a cab. I couldn't work that well. I was pretty unemployed. I was crazy for a long time. I took a bus back to San Francisco and I remember I walked into this person I was supposed to see in San Francisco Police Department and I don't know what happened to this day but they couldn't find anything. And I walked out of there and the amend I did not want to make. I decided and I'm standing on the street corner in California and I went to a payphone and I called this guy. Now, the Mafia in San Francisco is run by a group called the Broadway Association, or used to be. And the head of it at that time was everything you ever wanted to see in a movie. Short, Italian guy, silk suits, pinky ring, talks sort of like Marlon Brando did, you know? And I called him and I said, Gino, this is Mike. He says, Mike who? And I told him and he says, ah, oh, we haven't seen you around for a while. And I said, I got to see you. And he said, uh, why? And I said, well, I got some amends I need to make to you. And he goes, what? <laughs> I said, I got some amends I need to make to you. And he goes, well, come on over. And I knew he'd be there. And I go to their office up above this nightclub they own. And it, it, it was straight out of the movies. You walk up the stairs, and there's this great big goon there, you know. His name was Polly too. And <laughs> he's about 350 pounds, and you know, I know what he's got in here. And, and I go walking in, and he's sort of patch you down. He do, they don't patch you down. I mean, they just sort of come put their arm around you and, you know, hug you a little bit and feel you. And, and he says, Go on in. And I walk in, and Gino's sitting there, and I'm petrified. And by this time, I decided I was going to walk in, shake his hand, say, geez, I just wanted to thank you for everything you've done for me. <laughs> and I was going to turn around and leave. I'm, I'm serious. I, I'm serious. I did not want to do this amount. And for some reason, all of a sudden, I am standing in front of him. And I said, Gino, I stole money from you. And he looked at me. He says, What? I says, yeah, when I tended bar, I'd take 15, 20, 50 bucks a night, and I was smart enough to make the till come up even. I stole money from you. And he goes, why are you telling me this? He says, people don't do this. I said, what, steal money? He says, no, come back and tell me about it. I says, well, I'm in this program called Alcoholics Anonymous, and my sponsor said, if I don't make these amends, I can't look over my shoulder the rest of my life. He sa I said, I got to be able to look the world in the eye. And I wanted to look the world in the eye. See, I lived such a dirty life for so long, I wanted to be clean. I wanted to be clean physically, I wanted a clean place to live, and I wanted to be clean with you. He looked at me and he shook his head and he says, Mike, he says, I'm going to tell you what. He says, How much money you got in your pocket? I said, I got $40. He says, Give me $20, I'm going to call it even. But he says, Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Little did he know, 23 years later, I'm standing, I'm telling this all over the country. <laughs> this program has given me my life. And that's why I do this, is to come and share with you 
what it has done for me in hopes that it helps somebody else. It has given me my daughter's life, and it has given her her life. She is in nursing school. She's doing great. She's got that two and a half year thing going on right now. You know, she's telling me how to work my program. You know, I call her up and I go, oh, I was really pissed today. Well, if you do a proper 10 step. God. This program works on everything for anybody. I have never seen it fail. No matter what you have in your life, whether you are brand new, whether you have been around here for a long time, no matter what is happening in your life today, the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous will get you a new relationship with God and you will have peace, power, happiness, and a sense of direction no matter what you are going through at the present time. I remember when I got sober, I was, I was a taker. I took everything from everybody. And today I can honestly say that I have given more back than what I have taken. I can honestly say today that if I died tomorrow, there'd be some people at my funeral. I can honestly say today that if I died tomorrow, my daughter would have good memories of who I am. And she would be proud of me as I am proud of her. I owe my life to you. I owe everything I have to you. So I take my third step very seriously, which is when I turn my will and life over to the care of God, it is his life to do with me as he so chooses. And when I hit that place, I am not in this place of getting upset over every little thing all of a sudden. I sincerely appreciate being asked here and I hope we've had some fun this Sunday morning. Have a safe trip home. Thank you very much.